friend of pollinators. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. That's exactly what I needed. You're all great. All right. So again, sorry about that. Welcome. We hope that we are uh, able to provide more support and answers for you for your questions to inspire your beautiful habitat projects. Um, I would invite you to just sit back, relax, enjoy. There's really no need to take notes. Everything that I'm going to talk to you about tonight is going to be on our splash page that you have access to. Um, we're going to look at the splash page together just to give you some highlights. Um, we're just so thankful that you've taken your time to spend this with, uh, evening with us. We hope you will learn at least one thing that you can take back to your classroom this week. Um, the webinar uh, will be available on the splash page if you want to go back and look at certain portions again, or if you want to share um, with other pollinator educators. We know that you as the uh, participants of the online class already have a wealth of knowledge and we just want to be able to help your ideas bloom. So everything that we're providing this evening is just there for you when you are ready to go to the next level. We just want to do a quick shout out to uh, thank our funding partners at rely on their mission is to be the most sought after and admired lithium battery company in the world by helping their customers challenge and overcome their limits. Um, I think we've got Lori Lopez with us tonight from the Navico group. She's joining us to learn along uh, with you all. So just a quick uh, in I'd like to introduce the Because team. Uh, Tammy Enright is here with one of her four beautiful children. Uh, they were in Puerto Rico celebrating the opening of the La uh, Para Nachaliza uh, Bee Sanctuary, which is an amazing event. Um, Tammy is the executive director and the co-founder of the Because Project, and she inspires our team to think outside of the hive, and she is a passionate beekeeper. Um, on the right is um, uh, Mora Mayo Perez. She is the Director of Operations. She's been with us for close to two years. She is instrumental in facilitating programming. She manages our website and she's a whiz at shipping challenges. Um, I'm Emily Ellingberg. I'm the Director of Educational Programs. I've been with the BCOS since 2020. Um, I'm an 18 year veteran Montessori teacher and a backyard bug enthusiast. So this afternoon, um, our plan in, is to inspire you, hopefully, share resources with you, including our OER Commons, our Facebook, um, the Padlet that we I've sent you all, and how and why. Um, we're hoping that you'll use this, uh, this program, your magazine subscriptions, your educator kits, and then uh, any Q&A that you have. Um, along the way, if you'd like to drop questions in the chat at any time as you're thinking about them, we'll answer at the end, but just make sure, we just want to make sure that we can address everything kind of as you're thinking about it. So feel free to throw it in there and we'll look at the end and see what questions you still have for me. So you received a grant. <laughs> Where do I start is kind of some people's first question. Some of you are at different places in your journey. Um, you might be uh, rebuilding or starting fresh. So I say the best answer to where do I start is if you build it, they will come. Um, one of the best resources to get you started is the Eco Regional Planting Guide. It allows you to pick your plants based on soil condition, sun exposure, and the type of pollinator that you want to host. You enter your zip code to find out which areas are uh, that you're in. Um, and most of us are going to be in the outer coastal or the southeastern mixed forest. Um, it's also going to help you with seasonal planting so that you can have something blooming year round. So we'll just take a quick peek into that document. You can print it if you wanted to have it um, for quick reference, but it's always available. Um, and you can go to pollinator.org or you can use the splash page to find it. Um, it's also a really great document for your students to use. And it may not be that they can read it start to finish, but they can definitely, you know, look at parts and pieces of it. So it's got a great introduction to the pollinators in your area. And then it goes into what are some of the things that they are looking for as far as colored, um, you know, nectar, pollen, flower shape, all of that. And then it gets into an actual 
it's going to talk about farming. It's very important in our area. So it gets into a grid where that you can blow it up so that you can see it. Um, but the name of the plant, the botanical name, the common name, and then when it blooms. So trees and shrubs, but also uh, your perennials and vines that are available in your area. So it's a great thing for your students to use to reference um, or for you. I use it personally to you know pick things out to put in my yard. Um, and then it's also going to have some information about the habitat and nesting of your local pollinator. So what's in your area. So it's a great reference tool, great place to start. And again, you're going to use your zip code to find out which one of these is for you. So um, when you're planning, consider a few things. Pollinators have different mouth parts and different body types, which means that they're going to get their nectar differently. So if you look at the picture of the butterfly, obviously it's long legs, um, so it needs a steady place to land. So that's why a lot of times you'll see uh, cone flowers and zinnias for butterflies, because they need that landing pad. Um, they also have a long tongue or proboscis, so they can, you know, probe into the, the um, these, this is the disc flower portion of the flower, so they can land on these ray petals and still access the disc petals, which is where the nectar is going to be for them. You know, bees have short tongues, they have short legs, and some of them, depending on the type of bee, like this carpenter bee, have heavier body, bodies. So they're, like the type of flower that they're headed for is going to be different than the kind that a butterfly might be headed for. Um, also, just some food for thought about color, which we're going to talk a lot about how color affects your pollinators. Butterflies and bees have four or more photoreceptors. Humans, for perspective, have only three. So they're going to see things in completely different ways than we do. Um, bees see an ultraviolet, which means that for that plant that that bumblebee or that um, carpenter bee is on, that center throat is like a bullseye. It's saying, like, come, come for what I have. Um, so uh, a student actually told me recently that when you're planning your garden, you're planting, you're planning for VIPs, very important pollinators. He just completely melted my heart when he said that. Um, so uh, obviously your butterfly menu might be different than some of your other um, pollinators. So these are pr probably pretty common names that you rec recognize. Butterflies actually, even though they can see color in a different way than we give them credit for, um, color isn't as important. They really like anything. Um, I would consider if you're going to choose milkweed, try to find your local variety and not the tropical variety. Um, the tropical variety is beautiful and is easily accessible, like at big box stores usually, but it can actually cause a lot of complications for um, our native butterflies here. Um, and I also can uh, would also consider using both annuals and perennials again so that you can have year round blooms. And if you're familiar with cultivars, that's usually um, an adaptation to a plant to make it more aesthetically pleasing for humans. So, but it does make more problems for pollinators. They can't access the nectar and the pollen because the structure of the flower has changed um, from, from its original flower shape. So your B menu um, is, you know, things that are pretty recognizable also, your borage, salvia, um, Joe Pye weed is an amazing one. False indigo is a great plant to use and also native to our area. But don't forget about your native trees and shrubs for pollinators. If you are able to work that into your budget and your plan, you're going to be providing shade for your, um, your kids, for your students working out there, but also provide a resource for your pollinators. I would also suggest avoid double flowering plants. Pollinators can't get to the nectar. So think about the way that a rose is structured. Um, pollinators can't get to the center of most roses. It's too heavily uh, petal based. So they can't get to that center piece and they're after the center as we, as we know. Um, not sure if you're familiar with this concept. I hope you'll get to see it in your garden space. But some insects like bees are able to outsmart flower shape by nectar robbing. So this bee has figured out that inside of this flower is something that uh, she would like. So she's chewing a hole in the side of the plant to get to 
the um, where the nectar is here at the, the throat portion. So there's a lot of great connections that you're able to make with this adaptation that bees have figured out. Um, I know all of you are familiar with the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. That was part of the online class when my daughter and I did it um, back in August. She was in the front yard screaming, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's happening. They're nectar robbing up here on these salvia. So she got to see the carpenter bees truly just chewing a hole right through the side of it. So hopefully your students will get to see some of that. And it is really is very inspiring. Um, so moths are really overlooked as pollinators um, and they're not all night foragers. So you will possibly see some moths in your garden during the day. They're drawn to um, light colors and white. Um, and also if you notice like honeysuckle and morning glory have strong fragrances because they don't see well. Um, as, and if they are night foragers, they're you know twice as hard to find what they're looking for. So they will, um, follow the smell as opposed to the color. If you'll think back to the online class, we looked at Nature's Partners curriculum. Um, it's a full curriculum that's available on our website, um, and it also has some really great lessons and background information about being able to identify the difference between butterflies and moths using a few simple cues. So it's a great lesson if you haven't checked it out in its entirety. Um, there's also some cool experiments with testing different types of colored sugar water to see what type of pollinators you'll get to attract to that sugar water. So it's a really neat um, lesson as well. Beetles are another um, overlooked pollinator. Um, beetles are the most common insect on the planet. There are about 30, I'm sorry, 300,000 known types of beetles. And fossils have shown that beetles were on earth before bees or other modern pollinators. And they're believed to have helped flowering plants, also known as angiosperms, to develop about 100 million years ago. So they look for um, very open uh, flowers. They like for the flower to have an exposed sexual part. So you can see like in this magnolia blossom that this is a, a big attractor for beetles. Um, they're kind of the clumsy accidental uh, pollinator because they literally just kind of lop through there and carry the pollen with them to the next thing. But some of the things you can add to your space are Queen Anne's lace, fennel, sweet alyssum, asters, dill. And um, anytime that you're adding fennel or dill or parsley to your garden space, you're also adding host plants. Um, for your butterflies and moths and other uh, creatures that are going to need that for their um, young. So flies are another great pollinator. Don't know if you've seen those yet in your garden. Um, they're excellent pollinators and again, often overlooked. So they eat nectar and pollen for energy boost like other pollinators, but they don't gather anything to take home like other pollinators. So we think about bees and butterflies, well, not butterflies, but bees, um, specifically different types and like the native bees gather pollen to take back to their, if they're a honeybee, they're going to a hive, but if they're a native bee, they're going to some sort of nesting space and they're taking something back with them. Flies don't do that. Um, but they do pollinate by going from flower to flower, and they are attracted to really stinky things. They like um, flowers that smell bad. So um, they're an interesting pollinator for sure. And a hummingbird. Um, the menu for a hummingbird is going to be different because of its, you know, facial structure and how it's going to get the pollen. They do pollinate with their head, their feathers, and they their bill, and they pollinate when they feed. Um, they're the only ones in the garden who can see those bright reds and oranges uh, that the others can't really see. Um, one of my favorite flowers that's on here, the kufia, it's um, sometimes called a cigar plant because it looks like little cigars on your when it's blooming, and you can just watch them going crazy over it. Um, if you haven't uh, taken the time to look at the Flower Talk Book Club, um, it, it is an amazing lesson where you can connect these flower colors with the different types of pollinators. Even if you have older students, it's a really great resource. 
Um, and there is a lesson that goes with it also where they can design and test their own flowers with pollen. So you use like a pollen substitute like chalk or glitter, and then you, they actually resource they have so I'm so sorry. All right, is everybody, I hope everyone was able to get back in. I don't know why my internet just completely went out. I am so sorry. All right. All right, well, let's just keep trying to roll through that. Sorry about that, uh, everyone. Um, so habitat is super important and they have different ways of um, creating nest. So our nesting, um, mason and leaf cutters will use those pre-existing tunnels and tubes. I was saying as a homeowner, I like to leave my garden um, unkempt is a great word for it because your, um, your pollinators are using those dead stems and things that are out in your garden naturally for their nesting. Um, mason bees use mud, which is why they're called mason bees. That was kind of an aha moment for me not too long ago. Um, leaf cutter bees are actually live up to their name. This is a beautiful little leaf cutter here. She has cut a hole in a leaf and she's going to roll that leaf up like a cigar and actually fly carrying it to wherever she's decided to make her her nesting. So you can see in this uh, far left image where she's rolled them up and put them in there. Another student called that like, she's basically making a blanket for for her nest. Um, so it's a really neat thing to see. Uh, Tammy, our director's mom, recently saw one um, making a nest in the picnic table where the screw has recessed into the wood of the picnic table. So they're very, um, they're very uh, em environmentally aware of everything in their space and what they can use. Sweat bees and digger bees use open uh, bare soil to make their nest. And bumblebees and carpenter bees are gonna use abandoned rodent burrows and also upside down pots like clay pots. So if you have some, you can put them out. They also will use uh, piles of leaves for their nesting. So you may have heard about the leave the leaves campaign and that's why we suggest that. So mason bees, leaf cutters, mason wasps and carpenter bees will use native bee houses for their nesting. The structure that you may hang up, like if you used something like this center image, um, these can last for about two years and then they need to be replaced. If you leave it too long um, beyond that, you can cause a lot more damage than, than good um, because of different types of pests and different types of bacteria that grow in these. 
Um, they like for their house to be anchored to something. So like in this uh, middle image, this is anchored to the tree. So it's not going to sway in the breeze. breeze. They do not like for their house to sway. Um, closed on the back because they're going to use this entire tube to um, create their nesting space for their egg laying. And they like it to be at least four or five feet off the ground. And you may see like a roof structure on some of them. I've hung mine under the um, edge of my roof or under a tree because they do not like for water and the wind to damage what they've worked on. Um, you can actually make your own. This is one of our uh, links that's also going to be on the splash page for creating pollinator nesting boxes. This is shared from our good friends at University of Georgia Extension, another great document that your students can use as well um, for creating and building your own bee hotel or um, native bee house. So you don't really even have to buy the ones that you see in the store. Um, with a couple of different drill bits and some blocks of wood, um, you are in business and then installing your, um, your hive. And then it also gives some information about those different types of bees that you're going to attract. So no need to purchase, you can do it on your own. Um, water is another important thing to add. So um, pollinators, of course, need water. So you're adding simple options, making your garden a one-stop shop. So they're not going other places to get what they need. They're coming right to you. Um, this is a great thing for your busy students to work on. Um, those of your students who need frequent breaks, or if you need students that have to do heavy work in order to kind of like recenter and ground themselves back in what they're doing, carrying jugs of water out to refill the water station is great heavy work for those students. So let's get into some of your resources now that we have talked about a lot of different resources for your pollinators. Again, we've created this splash page for you for all of the things that you um, may need. And it's, you know, you can accept, access it um, from any computer. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight for you um, are uh, the Padlet link is on here as well as the QR code. So if you are, you know, can't find it, you've got it right there. Um, lots of different um, lessons and activities that we've kind of linked that go along with what we're hoping to accomplish with the Be a Friend. And then this is the resource roundup. It's um, all the things that we could come up with that could possibly help you in what you're working on. I'll talk a little bit about this um, webinar. This was hosted by Amy. It's a wonderful webinar that's linked on here. I hope you um, watch it or just turn it on in the background while you're working on something else. And then all of the national and South Carolina opportunities are listed down below. And then we have some Q&A just about who we are and what are some things um, that people frequently ask us. And then if you haven't used this uh, Be a Friend to Pollinators in your own backyard video with Miss Patricia, there's also a factile game that is a, like a Jeopardy style game that goes along with her web, with her quick video that she made to support that. So just some things for you to know that are right there at your fingertips when you are looking for them. But I wanted to highlight some of my personal favorites. Um, the South Carolina 4-H Youth and Development Agents are amazing resources for you. They can help you with implementing. They can help you with educating. Um, find your agent in your county. And if you don't know your agent, reach out to me. I will help you find your agent. They have so many tools at their disposal to assist you in your project. Um, they're just a wealth of knowledge and information. And that's, you know, the job of being an SC 4-H Youth and Development Agent is working with exactly what we're all doing with this project. If you've never accessed the National Ag in the Classroom website, um, it is amazing. Um, this is the link that goes directly to the curriculum matrix. So if you're looking to do something, about, you know, lesson about pollinators, you can search and it gives you just a list of everything that they have that's connected. So activities, lessons, books, um, it's, a, it's an amazing resource that in my 18 years, I did not know about. So it's there for you. And again, it's on the splash page. That's the best way to find it or just Google National Ag in the Classroom. 
Um, also, if you're not familiar with the Environmental Education Association of South Carolina and the Southeastern Environmental Education Alliance, these are your people. So these are the people who are really working in um, South Carolina and then, of course, in the Southeast in environmental issues and environmental education. You can choose to be a part of this network. Um, they have monthly meetings with the EEASC, um, and even if you aren't able to go to the meetings, they will email you the, the minutes from those meetings so that you can learn more that way. Um, I think you saw it in the online class, but I wanted to circle back to the Champions of the Environment. It is an amazing opportunity for you all. Um, I think they've just recently closed their uh, grant cycle. And if you missed it this year, I suggest getting back on it next year. Um, on the website, there is um, contact information to Amanda Lay. She is wonderful to work with, super um, accommodating, and will help you um, with to the best of her ability. Um, and again, I mentioned the in community engagement webinar. Um, Amy provides so much information in that about ways to get your community involved, um, organizations that I never even thought of that would be willing to help you um, facilitate what's going on in your in your garden space. So, you know, your state botanical garden, your local native plant societies, master gardeners who are willing to help you with your project. Um, lots of different uh, suggestions on people that are out there and that want to be involved with you. And then, of course, the Because Resource Library is available um, to you. I hope you will check it out. We aren't just about bees, <laughs> even though that is part of what we do. Um, you know, environmental education and especially pollinator education is just a huge part of what we do. So um, in here, are some of the things I'd like to highlight, the um, Pollinators movie, if you've never seen it on a personal level, it's an incredible movie that will just give you so much perspective on this idea of, of big pollinator business. And I never thought about it as being big pollinator business and how, you know, our consumerism is, you know, really drives this force. So the, this, is a, uh, this is a connection to the film, but also a film circle that we created to help guide older students through I, the ideas of, you know, these bigger concepts of what's like, what's my justice in this? What about food justice and things like that? And, and justice for the, the insects themselves. So I really highly recommend this for older students. Um, my pollinator journal is great for middle grades and can be adapted for lower grades. And then, of course, the Nature's Partners uh, is on here, as well as the six week bee unit um, is a great jumping off place for if you if you want to start with bees, they're kind of easy and accessible and a great place to start when it comes to pollinators. You can always find the Be a Friend to Pollinators lesson on here, too, as it's one of our favorites. And then there are some great um, digital field trips. So all of our digital field trips have some type of lesson, books, links, all different kinds of things um, to make it more than just watching a video at school. So there's a lot more to it than that. All right. So OER Commons, um, I was, like I mentioned, 18 year veteran Montessori teacher, I had no idea what open educational resources were. So essentially this is free, printable, shareable, downloadable, open rights for you to use. Um, the, it is a site that it, we have created and curated the best of the best of pollinator educational materials. And you don't even have to lift a finger. I'm going to email you an invitation to join our OER Commons. Everything within here is either Common Core or NGSS standards, because as an 18-year veteran Montessori teacher, I want to make it as easy as possible for you to teach education about the garden and about pollinators. So I've tried to do as much legwork as possible to give you all the things that you would need to be able to read through it and teach it that week. Um, it's organized by folders. I use my big old teacher brain and instead of a binder for it, I put them in folders. Um, and there really is something for every age, every ability and every season. So I do wanna take just a quick peek in there so that you can see what I mean by organized by folders. 
Um, when you access yours may look slightly different because I'm an admin on this one, but on the left side, you'll always see these folders listed. So the first one is just a welcome um, to OER and gives you some background information. And then you'll see it step one, step two, three, four, and five. Each one of those folders, when you click on it, has the same uh, buckets of information, different filling in the bucket, but same buckets. So there's always book club challenges, and those are for different reading levels from your little bitties that need read alouds through um, upper grades and chapter books. There's always a citizen science project that we give you information about how to get involved with your students and why it's a, it's a good one. There's always some type of curriculum or lesson plans within each folder, um, at least one virtual field trip, and then webinars and other recordings that we've hosted or that we thought were really helpful and beneficial for you. So each one of those levels has a, has a different number of um, I think this one has four book club challenges, but this one may have only two book club challenges, and I think one of them has like six. So this is more than a year's worth of curriculum. So take it at your own pace, dig through it. Um, there's also a folder on here called the buzz from our friends. That is... Um, those people who are in the community in the OER that have allowed us um, to use their materials and to use their information, a lot of this is um, cooking in the using the garden, and um, so and there are 119 <laughs> resources within there, so quite a bit. Um, and then we've done some work with libraries and um, with South Carolina 4-H Honeybee Project. So each of these is available to you. Um, it might not be exactly what you're looking for, but please feel free to poke through and um, explore the these 4-H project um, lessons. There are some really fun ones in there, too. Um, so yeah, it's available to you. Like I said, you don't have to lift a finger. I'm going to send you an invitation link after this evening. I didn't want to send it too early because I didn't want you to get it and think, oh my gosh, what is this? I don't, it's another thing in my inbox. And so um, I will send that for you. All right, so continuing on with your resources, we've created a private Facebook page for you. It's a great way for you all to connect with one another. Um, show us your progress, send us your pictures, ask questions, but engage at the level that works best for you and your students. Your time is valuable, we, and we completely understand, um, but use it to your benefit. I do wanna take a quick peek over just so you'll know what it looks like. And I did add, um, my mason bee uh, nest that I have it going in my backyard. I just added this today. Um, but and there's also a link um, here for you all to go and look some more to learn about mason bee wa or mason wasps because wasps are actually um, pretty pretty solid pollinators in your garden. So uh, I think a few people have already um, jumped on board and we've sent that link in your. Um, first email your welcome email, but it'll also be in your uh, educator kit that's coming to you. So Padlet, if you haven't used before, is great for students. It's kind of a Facebook for students to connect with one another, um, but we're going to manage it for you. So you don't have to manage what your students are saying. Um, we have all types of uh, system locks on it so that we can see what students are saying before it goes public. Um, so using Padlet is super, super easy if you've not used it before. Um, it's a safe place for students to interact. I think that's the most important thing for, for all of us. Um, you don't need an account to use it. You just simply use the, the link or the QR code. Um, if you have a if you have your phone with you, you can scan this QR code like right now, and it should take you right to the um, Padlet. And I'm going to show you how simple it is to actually add something. I mean, it literally is the easiest thing kids can, your kids can totally do it. Um, if you wanted to print out the QR code that is coming in your, um, in your educator kit, but also on that uh, email I sent you, that's the welcome letter, you could blow the, the QR code up laymate it, stick it somewhere in your classroom or somewhere in the garden where your students could go on and access it. Um, so I'm going to take us there now. 
This is what it looks like when you access it. I've already uploaded a picture. So when students are using it, all they're going to do, is, or you, you can use it too. You're going to hit that plus button. And I'm going to grab the same um, video that I posted of the mason wasps. Um, I'm going to drag it and drop it and give it a title. And then you can write something about it. Um, Okay, so because I am an admin, as soon as I hit publish, it's going to go live. Um, so for your students or for you or anyone else who posts on here, it's going to sit on this page and wait for admin to read it first. So once admin has read it, we can approve it and then it'll populate here. So I've given your students the ability to uh, comment to one another. And they can also light, you know, they can heart it, but there's no uh, voting and there's no like thumbs up, thumbs down kind of a thing. So all positive. Of course, I would recommend that you take the time to give them the rules and, you know, what you expect them to do with it. But hopefully this will just build itself out and be a great tool for them to reference and for them to brag about what they're doing. Um, pictures, uh, you can obviously videos work just as well. Um, and there you can hear my little mason wasps working their little hearts out um, and my neighbor mowing their grass. Um, but this, we hope to make this as user friendly as possible. And if for any reason you see anything that doesn't seem right, please contact me as soon as possible and I will fix it. Um, but it should be easy for your students to use and for them to connect and to share what they're learning in the garden. All right, so we're also offering you a one-on-one -on -one consultation, an hour-long call or Zoom um, for questions that you have so that we can discuss it, you know, just specifically about what you need. Um, I've taken this time before with people to walk them through OER and specifically um, dial in to what they're looking for. We can discuss your programming, your timeline for your planning, how you want to engage your students or how to engage your staff. Um, but if you'll just email me, you all have my email because I'm sorry, I've emailed you like a million times already, I feel. Um, but you're welcome to reach out to me and we'll set up a time that we will be happy to chat with you. Um, it's really helpful if you can let us know before we actually meet what you want to talk about so we can gather the information prior to our meeting. So, um, you know, just give it a thought about what what you really want to address and we'll come with as many resources as possible. And then, of course, you're also receiving um, a subscription. Um, my Bee Culture magazine came. So for those of you who are teaching the older grade levels, um, my, you should start getting it this week. Ranger Rick uh, took a little longer for us to uh, secure, so those should be on their way soon. Um, we plan to, to support you all with a monthly newsletter that will have some engaging things for you to use those subscriptions for, um, inspiration all year long. And if you're looking for something specific, reach out. If you have something that you want to talk to the students about, but honestly, you just don't have time to sit there and research it. Let me know. Sometimes I've already got it in my uh, Rolodex of information, or I can point you in the right direction and we can help get that information for you. Your educator kits are coming this week. Um, I'm so sorry to that our check system that we had hoped would, would work out so simple and so easy and breezy just didn't go the way that we thought, but the good news is, is the money is on its way. Um, so keep your eye out for that. And I would love to open it up to questions from you all. It looks like we've had a couple of comments. Aw. Um, so somebody said they went to Montessori school for from 18 months to eighth grade that you just basically described my child. So hopefully uh, <laughs> that's that is amazing. I love it. Um, Miss Joelle asked, where's the best place to find primary resources like three year old um, and six? So 
I would say that you can start with the um, six week B unit is really easy for you to adapt for your students. It says that it's a second grade through fifth grade lesson, but really that's just keyed in on the standards. So you should be able to use your standards to, to find you know what works for your age students. But there are so many great lessons in there about pheromones, about um, how pollination happens. Um, and I would I also think that you could use the six week B unit, though any of those lessons where they're simulating uh, pollination, again, the one that I mentioned where they're using the different colored sugar water is a great thing that you could scale down for your students. And then in OER, in that, um, like, let's see if I can go back to it, in um, Yes, down here in the buzz from our friends, uh, Edible Schoolyard Project, if you've uh, ever heard of them before, are wonderful. But inside of this insect collection um, folder, there are quite a few resources that are geared specifically to your students um, that are the, um, the little bitty friends. And then the book club challenges are also going to be great for you. Um, There's some great read alouds in here. Uh, the thing about bees, this is a wonderful uh, lesson that could be geared specifically to those uh, younger grade levels. And then on the website, you can see the Q&A webinar that we did with Shabazz. He's amazing. This is the author of that book. Um, in this lesson, he gives you a cell phone number that you and your students can text him questions. So he will answer the questions back. And I was like, are you sure you want to share your cell phone number with the world? And he's like, yes, this is what I do with this cell phone as I specifically give it so that students can reach out to me. I mean, that's just fan fantastic. So that would be any of the book clubs would be really great ones that you could connect with your students. Um, they're also here housed in the book club challenges. I separated them by Honeycombers book clubs and High Flyers book clubs. Um, any of them are wonderful resources, but this is going to be for your uh, lower grade level and then for higher grade levels. Um, so I didn't see any other questions in the chat. I'm happy if you uh, just want to open your mic and ask anything that you is a burning question. I'm going to stop share so that we can kind of see each other a little bit better. But I'm here. Ask away. Ah. Tammy, would you like to say something to everyone? Oh, do I have to unmute you? I'm so sorry. Um, Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for participating in this pilot program. Um, we have been super excited getting the uh, the organization, you know, up and uh, organizing everything and getting all of the documentation and the programming in place for you rock stars. Um, we couldn't do it without you. And I mean, Emily, thank you so much. I think this was super informative and I think it's a great way to kick it off. You know, we are as strong as, um, as you know, uh, stronger when we are all together. And I love seeing that almost everyone on the team was able to show up today and just encourage all of you to, you know, lean on each other and learn from each other. And, you know, we would love for this to be sort of, um, you know, it's the incubator for this program that we, uh, you know, expect to, to grow nationally. So, you know, any feedback that you have that you'd like to share that will make it better or um, more accessible or, um, you know, more appropriate for what you need, you know, please let us know. We want this to be a friendly and um, open environment for conversation so that we can all learn from each other. But um, thank you so much for your time and for what you do for um, your kids and uh, for the bees. Yes. I'm so sorry again that it, uh, but my internet dropped you all in the yeah. middle. Thank goodness we were able to pick up and keep going. So yeah. um, I I still will be able to post this. So you're still welcome to access it. Um, 
pardon the hiccup and feel free to share it with uh, anyone at your school or anyone that you know wants to get into pollinator education. Yeah. So. Any, any questions or Emily, do we have a forum for all of these educators to kind of continue on from here? Yes, I think the best way is connecting through the Facebook group, yeah. um, but also you can email me at any time. Um, and it, as you are finding things also that you would like to share, if you want to share those via the Facebook group, but if not, you can just email me directly and I'm happy to share it with the group and that might be through the newsletter. Um, trying to keep your emails to a minimum because as a classroom teacher, I know exactly what your email inbox looks like right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, we want to just share with you what you're all working on and things that you find that that work better. Um, so feel free to share it. I'm happy to send it out in the best way possible for everyone. Yeah, and I just have one more comment. I mean, this was a great presentation. It had so much information in it. Um, so, you know, thanks again for attending and thanks, Emily, for putting it together. But, you know, we are um, we are really dedicated and have set aside quite a bit of time over the next year for this cohort. So, you know, if if you feel like we've covered something or you want us to cover it again or if you need to call or, you know, reach out to either of us, you know, um, this is this is a learning process and every question you ask us is not going to be a burden It's actually going to help us do better next time and that's why we're in it you guys are going to help us you know meet our mission so um so you you're never going to bug us i promise so please you know quick text quick email put it out to the facebook group um you know let's let's work on this together and make sure it's super successful and if something's not working or if it's too hard then we haven't set it up properly and we'll fix it. So, you know, um, all of these resources are supposed to be easy to, to use and make your life easier, not harder, because we know how much you, know, you have on your plates. I love that uh, Ms. Joelle just said they planted 50 plus plants in their pollinator garden and to check out their social media at wow. Trinity Montessori Academy. They do have a beautiful garden already in progress and are just gonna continue to add to it, amazing. And uh, Jordan would like for us to give some information about social emotional resources linked to the garden and pollinators. So yes, I can definitely um, do some work on that and I couldn't agree more with you. Um, so many possibilities, right? So many connections that can be made. And sometimes you just have to um, zero down on, on what, what your student needs more than anything else. So social, yes, I got that. All right. Thank you all so much for taking your time. I know that right now you have a thousand other things that you need to be doing. So thank you for um, for this time. And I hope that the things that we will send to you will definitely um, will help you in this process. Digital high links for those who are visual learners. Great, great suggestion, Miss Tammy. All right. Well. Uh, if you have nothing else, then we'll call it an evening and everyone get some rest and um, we'll be in touch soon and keep an eye out for your pollinator kits. If you don't, if for some reason it is not in your hot little hand by next Wednesday, email me, but I will have tracking information so I can just double check everything, but I just want to make sure everyone gets their, their items. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.